Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Paul Peck Alumni Center at Drexel University. Today, my guest is the writer Francine Prose. Prose is the author of numerous critically acclaimed novels, nonfiction works, young adult, and children's books. She's a past president of the Penn American Center, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the winner of a Guggenheim, a Fulbright Award, and many other honors. She is also a veteran teacher and has served on the faculty of creative writing programs across the country. This is the first part of a two-part interview. In this part, we'll talk about Francine Prose's books with emphasis on her most recent novel, Lovers at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932. In the second part, we'll talk more generally about her formation as a writer, her taste in books, and her ideas about the teaching of literature and writing. Francine Prose, welcome to the Drexel Thank interview. You. Well, I've read many of your books, not all because you've written so many, I think more than 20, but I thought I'd um, like to talk about some that I know well and that uh, I find particularly compelling before moving to discuss your most recent, very engrossing novel, Lovers at the Chameleon Club. So let's start with Blue Angel, which was, uh, is a novel that got a lot of attention when it was published in 2000. Um, it deals with a complex relationship between a creative writing instructor and a female student, a male teacher, a female student, uh, whom he thinks has great uh, talent as a writer. Mm -hmm. and it, deals with the issue of sexual harassment in a very complicated, nuanced way, um, with unusual insight, I believe. Tell us about what inspired you to write that book. Well, uh, let me think. I was having lunch with my uh, editors and publishers of the previous book, and they asked me what I was working on. And I wasn't working on anything, really. I hadn't begun. And I just, it was as if I was possessed, and I said, well, I want to do a book about uh, obsessive love on a college campus set in a creative writing classroom based on the Marlena Dietrich film of the Blue Angel. And I have no idea where that came from. And then once I said it, I thought, well, I might as well do it since that's what I said I was going to do. So that's how it started. Your unconscious was working mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was uh, influenced by that case which you were involved with, the Stephen Dobbins case, someone at Syracuse University who was accused of sexual harass harassment and whom you defended for something that you didn't feel was sexual harassment? Uh, no, because that case didn't happen until I was three quarters of the way through. Really? Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize book, that. Yeah. I mean, we went, we went up to his hearing and so mm -hmm. forth, and, and it, of course the novel ends with a hearing in which I did borrow certain things from the hearing that actually happened, but it, it certainly didn't start that way. And actually, the truth is that I didn't have that much interest in the subject of sexual harassment. I mean, I was interested in the subject of obsessive love, and once <laughs> I knew that I was going to talk about that on a college campus, obviously questions of sexual harassment came into it. But that, that wasn't where it started from. That's interesting. Obsessive love and obsessive love for writing, too. I mean, the connection between the love for the student as it comes out of the mm -hmm. love for her writing mm -hmm. is so yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, he, I mean, poor Swenson, my hero, thinks that this girl, Angela Argo, is, is a great genius or, yeah. you know, I mean, and so all, you know, the, his erotic attraction and his attraction to her work do get kind of conflated and um, just add to the train wreck that he is. Yeah, I wonder also though, since you say that this happened later, the Stephen Dobbins mm -hmm. case, whether writing the book might have opened you to a certain kind of awareness of the complexity of this that might not have been there had you not written the book or been in the process what of What do you writing. mean, Paul? Well, all your books deal with the great nuance of mm -hmm. motive and so forth. But I wonder, because you were concentrating so closely on how, on what's the human element mm -hmm, behind mm -hmm. these sorts of things, whether you were so tuned in, you were tuned in in a way that you might not have been when that case exploded, so to speak, at Syracuse. 
Of course I was. I mean, of course yeah. I was. And, and I was more, even more interested. But on the other hand, it could have been anything. I mean, someone who I was very close to, a close friend of mine, was being accused of something that he didn't do. So it could have been first degree murder. It could have been animal cruelty. It could have been anything. I mean, it just happened to be sexual harassment. And it wasn't, he hadn't sexually harassed this young woman. He'd thrown, I mean, he'd been guilty <laughs> of bad behavior. He'd yeah. thrown a drink in her face at a party. But that, in a way, you could say is the opposite of sexual harassment. Interesting. I mean, it just happened she was a woman, so... so well, the uh, idea of sexual harassment now, the de definition seems to have gone very, very amorphous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I will give you an A if I get to throw a drink in your mm. face. I mean, it's, it wasn't like that. Well, uh, uh, that's a good segue, too, that the um, young adult novel that you wrote, I guess, nine years later, Touch. Mm -hmm. um, you've written a number of young adult novels. I love this novel. I mean, I'm very interested in young adult fiction, and I think what is extremely interesting about this novel is it, it does deal with sexual harassment of a young girl, I guess she's 14, and it involves her three close male friends. And it's such a nuanced, uh, um, very simple plot and language treatment of such a complicated thing. And I wondered, first of all, is did Blue Angel precipitate you into writing this book? Um, because you were perhaps tuned into that. Was there a connection between the two? I'm sure there was. I mean, I'm sure, you know, obsessions of, er of all mm -hmm. kind run all the way through. But, but Touch was written quite a bit after Blue Angel. So, uh, and it came from at a very different place. I mean, Touch, I was really, I mean, even though nothing like what happens in the book happened to me, you know, none of the overt events. I mean, the fact was I was writing out of memory. I mean, that is, when I was a kid, I had very close friends who were boys, who were, you know, my friends at school, my friends in the neighborhood, and suddenly uh, we all went through puberty and just everything, Changed. everything fell apart, <laughs> yeah. So I was trying to recapture what that moment was and, and the sense of unfairness and betrayal, I think, that went went with it. It's true that, you know, one can reduce it to saying it's about a sexual harassment case, but it's so much about a coming of age in mm -hmm. a way and a change in the relationship of, of the sexes and a disillusionment with friendship that mm -hmm. often happens. It doesn't have to be across gender lines. Well, the young um, girl in it, I mean, she feels that it's not her fault that she's suddenly grown a pair of breasts. I mean, why should she have to be uh, guilty of that and why yeah. should that change everything and and i can remember that quite clearly like i'm still the same person my body may have changed but i'm still the same person and i think those are the emotions that she's experiencing yeah it's very well well rendered i wonder what was the response to it from young readers did you have uh meetings or did you give talks to young adults there you know there was a i've had varying responses to the young adult novels this one was very um just to use a bad pun, touchy for people. I mean, people didn't, kids did not want to talk about it. It was still yeah. too, too raw and too threatening. So the earlier novel after, which was about the way in which, you know, the high school is police state, the dystopian mm -hmm. novel in which an ordinary high school gets turned into basically a prison camp, kids love to talk about that book because they're in the middle of it. You know, yeah. that book, I mean, I wrote basically by going on the internet and, and Googling preventing high school violence. And what I got was, uh, you know, locker searches, backpack searches, metal detectors, random drug tests, blah, 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 blah. And I just structured the novel that way and just took it further. Mm -hmm. But now, and kids are still reading it because when I go into schools, uh, a lot of the schools I go into still have metal detectors and, and no one seems to want to talk about it. I mean, the kids hardly notice anymore, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Plus, the kids know perfectly well that if you want to bring a weapon into school, you can do, and it's not a big problem, you can do it. I mean, they know that. But, uh, but that's something that, that when you just start to talk about it, they're kind of stunned because no one is talking about it. Well, another book that made a great impression on me was your 2005 book, A Changed Man, and that also got a lot of attention. And it tells the story of a young man who had been part of a neo-Nazi group who decides to assist a peace organization headed by a Holocaust survivor. And um, what's so interesting and ambitious about the book is the complexity of motive for both characters, both 
the neo-Nazi, or former neo-Nazi young man, but also the head of the, the Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what was uh, so unusual and so compelling about the book. Um, but unlike Blue Angel, which also I thought dealt with a complexity of motive, more from the professor's point of view than the students, mm -hmm. but here you end with a really triumphant love story. And I wondered if you had any difficulty or whether you know, there was some balancing involved in keeping that motive complexity and so forth, and then ending with that, that wonderful romantic ending. Was that something you juggled with? Well, I became yeah. kind of attached to my characters, uh -huh. so I wanted something good to happen to them finally. So, uh, you know, but, it, but it's a strange ending because whether these two people will be happy together and how long it will last seems pretty dubious to me. I mean, I <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's not exactly a Hollywood ending given who the characters are. Right. So, but I, you know, I wanted them to have that moment of at least thinking there was some kind of promise. I had a strange experience writing that book. I, after I wrote it, I guess just before it was published, I was giving a reading uh, at Sewanee, at the Sewanee Writers' Conference, and a poet in the audience came up to me and said, okay, this is weird, and I said, what? And he said, his sister worked for the Wiesenthal Center. His sister was divorced, the mother of two kids, like my character. His sister had become involved with a guy who had turned himself into the Wiesenthal Center uh, as a sort of poster boy, a former neo-Nazi for, for redemption like my character. So basically he told me the entire story of my novel except that it had happened to his sister and I'd had no idea. That's so interesting. So I know, stuff like that happens And did all they the end up together, these two people? I don't, know, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> um, no, it is, I mean, it was, it's, it's both, I guess, slightly contrived but also very uh, um, satisfying, the ending to that to the book. I wanted it to happen, and it mm, happened. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, so whatever happens afterward, mm. I don't want to know. <laughs> um, the, uh, another book uh, I want to talk about briefly with you is um, your book on Anne Frank, 2009. Uh, Anne Frank, the book, the life, the afterlife. It, the book covers a lot of ground about that famous diary. But a major point you make is that Frank was an artist, um, a very self-conscious mm -hmm. one very involved with shaping her work in a certain way. And I wonder if you could briefly tell us how you come to that conclusion. Well, she rewrote the entire diary from start to finish during the last four months that they were in hiding. And, and the very versions of the diary exist. I mean, it's very hard to read because there was an original version she wrote. And then starting in March, I guess, of, of uh, four, they were arrested in August, so starting in March, uh, she began went back to the beginning and rewrote the entire thing because she'd heard a radio broadcast in which the Dutch Minister of Culture in exile said that after the war, the Dutch people would like to hear accounts or read accounts of what the people mm -hmm. had gone through during the war. So she thought, oh, my diary is just exactly what he has in mind. So she went back and, for example, the, the Dear Kitty uh, thing that she added that at the end. So, uh, and then there's a second version, which is her revised version. And then the third version, which uh, Otto Frank made by putting the first two together. So, so the Dutch have published all three versions. Uh, it's hard to read because it's published in sort of bands that go across the page, but, uh, but you can track the changes she made and the editing she did. And I, I think just knowing that there was this artistic element involved in the shaping of it makes you feel both better and gives more pathos to the, mm -hmm. to this, to the fact of the diary. Well, a lot of people yeah. seem quite irritated by it. I mean, I went on. Really? Uh, yeah. Because I went on tour for the book, and people, I mean, it was kind of shocking to me that a lot of people seemed to have a very passionate and personal relationship with Anne Frank, and, uh, and really didn't take well to the idea that this wasn't a purely spontaneous, you know, I mean, because the image in the, uh, in the film and the Broadway play is this, this kind of ditzy girl lying on the floor, kicking her feet in the air. I mean, she was anything but. Mm -hmm. So when I would say, uh, actually, this didn't happen, actually, she was a very conscious writer, and, and so forth, people would become quite annoyed because I was interfering in their vision of who this person was. So uh, it, wasn't That's the, very interesting it wasn't the greatest to book tour, let me tell you that. Really, yeah. and I, I think, I guess people want this unmediated, and also the everyman sense mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. Anne Frank as opposed to the artist, right. which puts her in a different place. Yeah, well, I, um, I mean, you know, yeah. I could do it too. Well, yeah. yeah, if you were in hiding for two years and you were a genius, you could do it too, but short of that, probably not. Right. <laughs> 
Um, your 2003 book on gluttony, which is part of the Oxford University Press series on the seven deadly sins, is a book I really like. Um, I wonder first if you got assigned the topic of gluttony, or did you choose it? They asked me which of the deadly sins I wanted to do, uh -huh. and I was apparently the first person they called, and I, it, I didn't. I said gluttony right off the bat. Um, well, I thought it was a great choice, and you know, you trace the changes in the attitude toward gluttony over time. Um, as religious issues have given way to issues of beauty and health and mm -hmm. so forth. My sense is, and what makes it, I guess, seem endearing to me is that you're slightly pro-gluttony, if I may say so. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think it's a sin. I mean, one yeah. of the reasons I picked it is that I don't, yeah. you know, and then, I mean, afterwards people were saying, well, there's all kinds of gluttony, you know, this oil consumption is mm -hmm. kind of gluttony, having an SUV, which I do, is kind of gluttony. Uh -huh. Well, but eating really, who are you harming but yourself? I mean, it's not as if you're actually taking food away from somebody else mm -hmm. if you're eating it. So, so of all the sins, it seemed, the most innocent, so it was partly why I wanted to do it. Also, I was interested in the way uh, the, our idea of body image had changed over four or five hundred years, so that was the other thing that, that attracted me to it. And your discussion of women and dieting and the fact that depriving themselves mm -hmm. of this pleasure of food is so much a part of our culture and seems sad. Yeah. yeah. Well, it starts with, you know, St. Yeah. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, and it goes all the way up to to modern diet products and so forth, you know, bogus internet uh, weight loss products. So that brings us, uh, I mean, I could talk about many more books. You have a book on Caravaggio that I really like, but um, the 17th century Italian artist. But we're not going to talk about that because I would like to get to your most recent book, um, Lovers at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932. And it's set in the 30s and 40s in Paris. And it mixes real characters with fictional ones. But I wonder why you decided to use the outlines of real characters and fictionalize them rather than make up the characters or actually use the real characters as you would in a historical uh -huh. novel. Well, the story of Violet Morris was so outrageous that I didn't think I could make I couldn't make it up. I mean, no one could make it up. And I, <laughs> and I felt that I needed. I needed the sort of armature of history underneath it just to have it mm -hmm. be persuasive because otherwise who would believe it? But I also thought it would be much more fun to, to just, that I would have a lot more freedom if I invented around them so that I used certain events from her life as, as reality and certain events from the life of Brassard, not that much. And then a voice like Henry Miller's voice. I mean, there's, not, there's very little about what actually happens to Lionel Mann except that he goes to Paris, he goes back to the United States leaving a wife and child back in Jersey or Brooklyn. Uh, but other than that, I just invented him, keeping the voice of, of a Henry Miller-like character. Yeah, his voice is terrific. It's just so, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I won't say unlikable, but... Um, no, well, you wouldn't want to hang out with him. I wouldn't him. want to hang out with yeah. him. That's, that's a good way of putting it. Now, this Lou Villers, Louisiane Villers, mm -hmm who is the kind of the central character, although her voice is not, we don't get her voice directly the way we do the other mm. characters. She's a young French woman who I guess would be called transgender today. She's a lesbian woman who um, becomes an Olympic athlete and racing car driver and later works for the Gestapo mm. in occupied Paris. And she is modeled on Violet Morris, a uh, real person, um, whose life parallel lose in many ways. and you seem to have been launched in your interest in her by a photograph um, of Violet Morris with a companion entitled Lesbian Couple at Le Monocle, 1932. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that photograph as it, I guess, compelled you or launched you into the writing of the book. Well, it's a very well-known photo that I'd actually known for a long time. Two women sitting in a bar, one uh, is sort of cradling the elbow of the other. One of the women is dressed in an evening gown, uh, kind of spangly evening gown, and the other is dressed in a tuxedo, a man's haircut, pinky ring, uh, chunky, butch, and that's Violet Morris. And so um, did you see the novel sort of blossom from there? <laughs> if only, no. I, I just saw a little wall text that said that Violet Morris had been a, a torturer for the Gestapo, which I hadn't known. And then I looked up the rest and found out the rest. You know, just as you said, she was an yeah. athlete and so forth. So, so I knew a certain number of things about her life, and I just had to invent 
all the kind of connective uh, tissue that put the parts to, put the points together. What do you you know? You create this character. You know, you sort of build her, mm -hmm. and then she becomes this sort of atrocity. Um, and, but that seems to be your way. You're so interested in turning things around and finding the truth behind the stereotype. Um, is there anything you want to say about this character, what you learned about human nature in creating, in writing this character? Well, I was trying to make her as sympathetic as a Nazi torturer can be. I mean, it was quite a challenge, really. Uh, but, you know, yeah. she's, she was a human being. She was yeah. a human being, and she had... Uh, Nothing had gone right for her. I mean, all she wanted was to be able to be an athlete and to be loved, and no, neither of those two things was, was permitted. So all that resentment and anger got channeled into, uh, into hideous political loyalties and put political actions. The period in which you set this novel, um, Paris in the first half of the 20th century, very rich terrain, much plumbed by writers. Did you feel daunted in any way tackling this material with all these people that have been dealt with both, you know, they themselves have written books and have been written about. Um, tackling that subject matter, how did, how did you feel going into it? I didn't, I just didn't think about it. I mean, I didn't, you know, because, <laughs> yeah. because it was clear to me that the story of Violette Morris hadn't been written That's in a true. novel. So that was, that was completely on mind as far as, I mean, there were, you know, there's this Kind of terrible French biography, but that was about it. Mm. And apparently, there's a new one, but not. But it didn't come out until after I'd finished the book. So, you know, it wasn't as if I was sitting down to write about Hemingway and Fitzgerald. I mean, that had been done and done a lot. I mean, these were characters. I mean, I guess Henry Miller has written about himself more than I could possibly write <laughs> about him. But, yeah. uh, but their interactions and and also. Of the characters, only three of them really are actually based on history. I mean, the, there's a baroness who's a little bit based on Peggy Guggenheim, but not very much. Mm -hmm. So the rest are invented characters, and certainly their relationships with one another are completely invented. So I honestly don't even think of it as a historical novel, particularly. I think of it as a contemporary novel that just happens to be set in the past. I mean, another thing that's very interesting about the novel, and also you know, utterly original, is the use of point of view. You use, I guess there are three main narrators. There are other narrators. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one character who doesn't really have a direct voice is Lou Villers. Um, we see her mostly from the outside. But the construction of the novel must have been, I mean, you have letters by Gabor home to his parents, and you have Lionel Maine writing and then you have this amateurish biographer writing a, Amateur is the kind <laughs> yeah, construction. a biography of uh, Lou Villers. So, and then there are other interpolations in there. First of all, was it hard to construct the novel from this point of view? And second of all, tell us about your thoughts about having these multiple and multi-level and even different places in time mm -hmm. points of view making the story. Well, the thing that's strange about it, I mean, there are lots of novels that have multiple points of view. It mm -hmm. shifts, shifts back and forth. But the thing that's uh, unusual about it and that made it, I don't know about hard, but, but I certainly didn't have any model to work from, is that they're all, except for one, I mean, the, the narrative that's uh, Yvonne, the owner of the Crossdressers Club, mm. except for her narrative, they're all written documents of a certain kind. I mean, right. uh, Gabor's writing letters to his parents. Uh, there's this sketchy biographer writing biography of Lou. Uh, two of the women are writing memoirs. Lionel Maine is writing his kind of Henry Miller-like novel. So, so not only are they telling their stories, but they're telling their stories with a particular audience uh, in mind. I mean, uh, the Baroness wants her memoir published. Suzanne, the resistance heroine, claims not to want her memoir published. So, uh, so they're writing for other people. Yeah. So it's very different than, you know, when you're writing a, a first person narrative, there's always a question of who's, who's out there? You know, who yeah. is the person telling the story to? In, in, in this case, it was very clear to me who was out there or who they thought they were writing for. But, but for that same reason, it was unusual because I, can't, I couldn't think of another book like that. I mean, a friend of mine said that reading the book is like getting into a very weird archive 
and yeah. and it is. It's an art. It's a strange, completely invented archive. It's a, such a writerly novel, you know, in that sense. It's about it's about these people, but it's also about writing mm -hmm. and about how they write themselves. Mm -hmm. And that I think, from a for a writer. Um, is very fascinating mm -hmm. to read and to try and get beyond the way they, they're representing mm -hmm. themselves. Um, we're almost out of time, but I, I wondered about, um, you know, we've talked about a number of genres, a number of books you've written in, the, in different genres. I wonder which you feel most comfortable in. It seems you've written more novels than anything mm -hmm. else, but is that the genre you feel most comfortable in? I, it's, I prefer it. I prefer it because, you know, you're making it up and, and it's, <laughs> it's fun. It's just pure fun. I mean, it's not always fun, but it's... Yeah. But uh, if you're doing nonfiction, you get the, do the research, you get the information. I mean, in the same way, you're trying to tell a story and construct a narrative and write as well as you possibly can. But still, there it is. You know, once you have all the material, you have all the material. Mm. Whereas with a novel, you just don't know where it's going. So there's the element of, of huge surprise, which is very rarely there writing nonfiction. But do you like to alternate? I mean, is it the sense I that... I have to you, alternate. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's certain writers, wonderful writers. I mean, Philip Roth can just pop out novels one after the other. But I don't seem able to do that. So, so because I like to be writing, uh, it's, it's very helpful to be able to write nonfiction in between novels while I wait for the next novel to show up. Okay, well, I'm looking for the, forward to the next, whether it's novel or thank you. nonfiction. And I thank you very much for being here today. Thank Francine you, Paul. Thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview.